Michael Palin is coming to Ireland again, um, and he's on the line. How are you doing, Michael? Um, I'm fine, actually, Ray. Thanks. Yeah, very um, well. Thank you very much for taking our call. It's a real pleasure to interview you. Yeah, it's um, okay. we better get this out of the way before we start. My wife fancies you something terrible. Uh, oh, dear me. <laughs> do you get well, that a lot? Wonderful. <laughs> well, not from your wife so much, no. <laughs> one, one to other wives, but uh, she's not made this known before, so I might yeah. uh, <laughs> take her up on that. Lovely. Now, occasionally people do say nice things like that, and I realise it's about sort of 50 years too late. <laughs> oh, well, no, no, it's never too late. Of course, you're oh. happily married for a, a, a long time. Of um, course I am. Of course you are, he says. <laughs> yeah, spot on there. Man. Very definitely, yes. Of course I yeah. am, of course I am. <laughs> I think it was um, uh, Himalaya. That, that, that's where the attraction between my wife and you um, started. Uh, particularly Bhutan, because we both fell in ah. love with Bhutan and then we fell in love with you oh, in Bhutan, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, that's, uh, that's being associated with the right kind of scenery and, and it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful, yeah. And, and of all the places you've been, do people... Um, come up to you and want to talk about one particular place a lot, you know, because they've been there, or they love it in particular. Yeah, I can. Uh, living in London, we have um, sort of cab drivers and people um, selling you things in shops from all over the world. And I, I strike up lots of conversations <laughs> with them, you know. There was a man from Ethiopia and he. He said, oh, we saw your program in Ethiopia. We really liked it. And I said, well, that's very nice. He said, no, you know, we liked it because you didn't go to Ethiopia because there was a flood or a famine or a crisis. You just went there because you were trying to get through Africa. <laughs> yeah. And you just saw the people as the way they were. And I thought that was a very, very, um, that, was a, that was a high compliment. <laughs> uh, so, so you're coming and sort of touring with your diaries, the 30 years tour. Yes, uh, yeah. And you, you, people will be very jealous of you because as well as doing all the other things you do, comedian, scriptwriter, novelist, actor, playwright, uh, intrepid traveller, you're also <laughs> a, a sort of uh, an obsessive diarist. Um, so you've been doing it since 1969. I have, yeah. That was, the, um, that was about the 15th attempt to start a diary, but it's one that stuck. And quite by chance, you know, I started April the 17th, 1969, because I'd just given up smoking, so I had extraordinary willpower. I thought, oh, I can, what can I do with this newly sort of activated willpower? I thought, well, I'll try and keep a diary. And within a month, John Cleese had rung up, and we were, we were getting together uh, the first meetings of what later became Monty Python's Flying Circus. So it's, it's really the start of Monty Python. And was he mentioned in that first entry, John Cleese? Um, yes, yes. John, John was mainly the first entry. I think was about Terry Jones, who was my writing partner at the time. Okay. And he'd gone away uh, on holiday, and I had a breather for about a week. We'd been working solidly for about five years since leaving university, writing comedy for everybody, for everybody. Roy Hudd and you know, and uh, the two Ronnies and Marty Feldman, anyone who'd have our work, because we were young lads just starting a, starting out in married life. We needed the money. Mm. Um, and because it, there's one I was reading your uh, piece in, in The Guardian on uh, diary writing and there was one entry there which like it was all pretty sort of common at the time common for you like mm. David Jason came around for lunch and uh, uh, David Frost rang because he heard a rumour that yourself and John Cleese were doing some sort of programme in the future yeah. uh, and when you look back at it that was the sort of the genesis of that was the beginning of Monty Python yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, David Jason uh, worked with Terry Jones and Eric Idle and myself on Do Not Adjust Your Set, which I think we first did in 1967. And it was a sketch show with the Bonzo Dog Band, very much a precursor of Python. Um, and then John, yeah, John, out rather out of the blue, this big star, because he was a big star then, John, of the Frost Reports, rang up and said, look, why don't we all get together and try and write something completely new? So... We did. Or something completely different. <laughs> yes, that was... Uh, <laughs> and, and Tom, your son, I have a son, Tom, as well, by coincidence. Um, so you sort of, he was in the back of your mind that you were writing the diary for him, that he would, you know, read it at some stage in the future. He's, he's now in his mid-40s. Mm. Mm. Um, well, I, well, yeah, I don't know if I was writing it absolutely for him, but I thought that, you know, my immediate family will be the only ones who would ever see this diary, ever. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he's in mid forties now. Yeah, uh, when you because you would have to read back through them to get them published. And um, did did you spot patterns in your behaviour that you were unaware of? <laughs> that I was unaware of. Yeah, do you know the, way, um, the other day sometimes you know because yeah. because I, like I just I dipped into because I'd read it but halfway to Hollywood mm. and uh, the the whole time around the the release of the missionary which you wrote and, and acted in uh, there was a mm. lot of you know self doubt there. You know, it was, yes. it was a recurring theme, if you like. 
<laughs> um, well, you know, I, I that's true. And I was aware of it at the time. And I felt I've got to mention this to myself when I'm writing this down, because that's uh, the way I approached almost everything I did was, uh, first of all, curiosity. Second of all, availability. Oh, yes, you know, I've rarely said no to anything. I couldn't afford not to. And then doubt came, you know. You suddenly realise, my God, this is going to be harder than you think. And uh, what have you got that others don't have that you could put into this? And, mm. and that, I think, must be... I, I don't know. I suppose there are some people so secure they just breeze in and do what they want. But most actors, most people I know, and most people I like, have that element of, uh, of of questioning what they're doing, and it makes the work better for it. I think. And of course, it was very much you. Uh, like you know, Monty Python is an ensemble, and you know, the the the, the glory and the blame can be spread spread around evenly. Um, but then the missionary, you wrote it and you acted in it. And similarly with the the travel series, because that was very much Michael Palin. You were putting yourself out there. Yeah, yeah, except I think that's always slightly exaggerated because I had one of the best camera, documentary cameramen in the BBC, Nigel Meakin, mm. and he would be shooting stuff when I'd finished doing what I was doing. And at least 50% of those programmes are just the beauty of the world as seen by a very skillful cameraman. So I have to remember that, you know, he was, produ he was uh, providing wonderful material. And also, I mean... Uh, I, although it was, I was guiding the whole thing through, it was very much about the people I met and how they reacted and what they talked about, uh, rather than about me pontificating mm. as I went around the world. So, uh, you know, I, the world can share the blame as well. You're understating <laughs> the, your role, I, I, I think, because you say somewhere that you, were, uh, you now know that you were the fourth choice that they went to three other people yeah. before they stopped at you. Uh, who were... Right, no, no, it, it's, I, it's fifth now. Sorry, sorry, three other people, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, it was, it was, it was oh, four it other people. Yes, four, was it four other people, yeah. Yes, uh, afraid so, I've just only just heard that oh, Clive have you James right? was, sorry. Uh, who, who else was there? Uh, Clive James. Um, uh, Alan Wicker. Right. Uh, first of all, and then... Um, uh, Miles Kington, a very good journalist, young guy, about my age, met him at Oxford. He died about three or four years ago, tragically early. And um, and the other one was Noel Edmonds. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I don't laughs. need to laugh, you know, but there we are, you know. I could have done Mr Blobby, he could have gone around the world. You know? yeah. Yeah. If How things different, different things might have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, were you unaware at the time that you were fifth choice? Oh yeah, I yes. just thought they 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 praised me to the skies. Okay, yes, said, as they do. Only you have the yes. grace, the <laughs> the beauty, the 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 daring, the sense of adventure, courage, humour, <laughs> psychological understanding. I just I said, okay, you don't have to go on. I'll do it. <laughs> but I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I was the one who said yes. I've absolutely no no regrets, as you can imagine. Yeah, and um, the book sold really well. Was Himalaya? That was the best selling of all the books, was it? Yes, Attached. Himalaya was the yeah. best selling of all the books. Yeah. Why do you think? Um, well, I think Himalaya had a kind of unity to it. It was a journey through these extraordinary mountains, but also there was a great deal more to see on the ground than just the mountains and peaks. There were sort of the monasteries of Tibet. We went down through uh, Bhutan, as you mentioned. We also went uh, um, out through Bangladesh. We are also right up into Pakistan in the northwest frontier. Stunning scenery, great people. But I think it just had a sort of power uh, to it all. And also it was a pretty kind of tough journey to do. I remember on the ascent up Annapurna, um, I got uh, altitude sickness allied to a cold that I was carrying at the time. And I honestly felt I was at death's door. I, I really worried at one point whether I'd actually be able to carry on. Mm. And I think uh, audiences could tell that and could tell it was, it was tricky. And they were kind of um, on the edge of their seats a bit, I think. Um, last year, uh, Monty Python went live um, in front of 15,000 people. And it was on telly and it was mm. in cinemas. Um, yeah. yeah. How was that whole experience? Well, in the end, uh, to my great relief, it was terrific. <laughs> before, <laughs> right. before it, I was, I was again, you know, yeah. nervous yeah. as one should be before these things. You don't just walk in something like that. The added element was that we would use quite a lot of hype in the publicity because, you know, when you're selling out trying to sell out an auditorium of 15,000. You have to use other methods than if you're just in a 150-seater or a 500-seater. So we'd sort of set ourselves up for a big fall, and I just hoped that we wouldn't let ourselves down and we hadn't oversold ourselves. And um, 
it wasn't till we actually got on stage that first night and I think we all felt this kind of power of the audience. And, and I mean, it's, it sounds corny, but it was a kind of warmth and affection from the audience. Uh, we knew everything was going to be all right, provided we just st stood up and carried on, you know, and, yeah. uh, and got the words roughly right. They were happy to be there with us. And from that moment on, uh, it, was, it was like the years had rolled away. It was like sort of 45 years ago when we first did those sketches. They were as fun to us and we were enjoying ourselves on stage and I think that was important. If we hadn't enjoyed ourselves, the audience wouldn't have done. And of course there are people now who know Monty Python better, better than you do. Most people do. do, yeah, do yeah. They, yes. Certainly know it better than John. He <laughs> right. couldn't remember a thing, poor old darling. <laughs> and what's the most common thing shouted at you? <laughs> <laughs> and both of you shouted at you, get off! <laughs> uh, I, I don't I can, uh, Spanish Inquisition, people, yeah, yeah. people love. Nobody expects <laughs> or me, me. You know, there's these silly things we wrote late one night all those years ago that are now, you know, around the world. People in people in Russia sort of watching the, 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 the yeah. last night of Monty Python and Mexico and all over the place. And is, is genius overstating it? No, I think that's understating it, really. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think we left genius behind a long time ago. Um, yeah. I, I, I think we were... The, the great thing about Python was these, these complete disparate group of people coming from, you know, although we had university backgrounds, we all had different views of life and all that sort of thing, uh, who happened to spark off each other and create something that really really worked and i don't know quite why we did but we did and, and it was a nice balance of people i think that, that's what really was the responsible for it and also i mean we could we could all act i think that was kind of something that people forget and i think oh we're just comedians and, and, and just mm. doing a, a comic term but it was all i think everyone could do their their roles we have to play 10 roles per show and sometimes in the films doing 15 roles each and you had to get them right you had to be precise so yeah. I think the fact that we acted well was something to do with it which one of you was most comfortable in ladies clothing terry jones i should think right, right yeah. um yeah terry loved it because dear terry didn't look particularly sort of attractive um, or, or, or so sort of sexy in women's clothes he looked like his mum and he loved his mum and it was really <laughs> rather lovely seeing Terry uh, and Terry would come into the room dressed in drag and say oh it's your mum oh yeah well, I do miss my mum <laughs> um, whereas John looked completely outrageous uh, yeah. in drag you know quite terrifying um, but uh, we, all, we all did a bit Eric was Eric was very good he's, he's rather nice little lady at the cocktail party kind of character yeah um, in the diaries, back to diaries, like uh, about a fish called Wanda, you, you said that you, you thought it was too nasty to be funny. Yes, I did. That's a very good thing about diaries. You, you make judgments and then the next day you find you've got it completely wrong. Mm. And I think what you're referring to is an entry where I, um, John's giving me the script and he's going to ring up and I'm wondering what I'm going to tell him. I didn't like it. I thought it was cruel. I thought it was over the top. I thought it was far too hard to be funny. Uh, five weeks later, you know, there I am in the back of a van dressed as a Rastafarian with a dog with knickers in, around its head. I mean, doing the film, the funniest film I ever was in. Yeah. So just how wrong can you get it? I mean, I think my, I, I talk about this on stage, but part of what what was so good was that John allowed Kevin Klein to do the sort of Basil Fawlty madness. And Kevin was very, very funny. And he made a nasty, repulsive character on the page, absolutely wonderfully silly and yeah. thick and stupid and, and laughable. Yeah. Uh, he did it very, very well. Yeah, it was very funny. So it, that's, um, in your opinion, the funniest movie you've been involved in? Um, well, that's no. I wouldn't say it's the funniest movie I've been involved in. I think that probably... Uh, Life of Brian right. or Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh, just because there was, you know, they were more complex and I was playing lots of different characters, I suppose. I mean, Wanda did work incredibly well it, and it was a kind of gentle film, really, um, despite being, you know, kind of lunatics throughout. But I think Holy Grail and, and Life of Brian were kind of more convoluted, richer in a way. So you're coming to Dublin, you're in Cork, 28th of October, the Olympia in Dublin on the 29th, and then Belfast on the 30th, the 30 years tour. Yes. Of course, you, yes, exactly. you, know, you know Ireland quite well. I know Ireland very well, yeah. yes, yes. Um, so I've, you I've did been the, there many times. did a programme here, a, a, a rail, yes. railway programme. Yeah, 
Well, I did. I first of all went to the Belfast Festival for several years, which is where I did my first one-man show all those years ago. Then we did a great railway journey from Derry to Kerry, which I actually talk about in in the show. And um, you know, I've been I, I've been to Dublin many times. Got good friends over there, and done uh, been been on the um, the late late show and book signings and all that. And yeah. and I think that that people in Dublin. Really, I mean that that the great audiences and Belfast and and Cork, I don't know so well, but certainly Belfast and Cork, I'm sure they'll be the same. They're kind of engaged with, with words, and they love words yeah. and word play and all that. Well, Cork would like to think they're the best audience because that's the would real, they? that's the uh, real that's the real capital. You know, they call themselves uh, the real it, capital. Well, that's it. I'll remember that. Yeah, I'll remember yeah. that. So <laughs> who, I shouldn't mention any of the other places. That yeah. been derogatory. <laughs> exactly. Fact. Exactly. Yeah, who, who's yeah. your favourite late late show presenter? <laughs> oh, that's not not fair. I mean, I, I, do, I know I'm doing. I know it's not fair. I'm not serious. I don't. No, have, you don't have I to answer do go that. Back. Yeah. I do remember Gay Byrne. Yes, put it that yes, way. Yeah. You know, and he was very, very smooth. But they're all. He's, uh, he's still know, around. They're, they're nice shows to do. Yeah, yeah. still around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And when you were doing the Derry to Kerry uh, or the Kerry to Derry railway thing, you sort of used it as a, an opportunity to chase your ancestry as well in Ireland. Yes, that's right. I was looking for my great. Uh, grandmother, who I knew was an Irish orphan who'd fled, uh, not fled, she was taken um, on one of the ships across the Atlantic and adopted by an American lady um, called Caroline Watson. And I didn't know much more about it, didn't know where she'd come from or anything like that. And I've gradually pieced together the story. Um, and in fact, she didn't, I thought she came from somewhere down near Mallow which is where we kind of uh, end, ended up our story. But in fact, she, I th think now she came from Letterkenny. Ah. And uh, she was, and we found that Caroline Watson was a very rich lady. And she, you know, Brita Gallagher, she was called, struck lucky. She was ad adopted by this lady who was very intelligent and wealthy and took her off to Europe to, um, to see the sights of Europe, which is where she met my... my um, my ageing uh, um, great-grandfather, Edward, who was on a walking holiday on his own, but he suddenly fell in love with this 17-year-old. This and uh, He wasn't supposed to be married. You know, he was a don at Oxford, and you had to be celibate at the time. You were okay. not allowed to be married. What age was he? He was 39 when he clapped eyes on... Uh, right, 22 on years or yeah. senior, yeah. Yes, yeah. He was on a walking holiday, so there's something in the jeans there. Um, <laughs> but he wasn't wearing jeans. I know what you mean. Sorry, that's a very poor joke. <laughs> no, it's yeah. fine. From you, you see, it all works. Is it? If I try that, that okay? one. Well, yeah, that's good. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you better say hello to Jenny or she'll... That's my wife. Just say hello, Jenny. Yeah. In your best Michael Palin sexy voice. Go on, go on. I'll, 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 I'll avert my ears. <laughs> hello, Jenny. Hello, Jenny. <laughs> I love you, Jenny. You make my brain hurt. Uh, Michael Palin, thank you very much. That's the end of that, that's the end of that relationship, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Cork, uh, the Olympic yeah. Theatre in Dublin and Belfast, uh, the last uh, few <laughs> days in October. It's the 30 years tour. Michael Palin, a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Bye.